In this video, I want to talk very briefly about the language R and why you might want to consider using it in your data analysis. Very simply, R allows you to do reproducible research. It allows you to build a workflow that's all the way from you know, importing your data, tidying your data, visualizing your data, building statistical models, etc., that's entirely reproducible. The language R has been around since about 1993. It's an open source language. The various statistical packages available in R reflect the latest advances in the fields of statistics and data science. There are lots of absolutely amazing uh, data visualization packages available in R, so you can do you know, wonderful graphics based on your research data. In many institutions, uh, the next generation of uh, scientists Master students, PhD students, etc., are all learning R, uh, and over the last few years, uh, you know, more and more institutions have been uh, encouraging their students to acquire data analysis skills using languages such as R and Python. So R and Python are the two most uh, commonly used languages uh, in in data science. Um, Python is a much more general purpose programming language, whereas R is focused very much on data science. The kind of coding skills uh, that you learn from using R are in great demand uh, in industry. Uh, the Office for National Statistics regularly advertise jobs where they require applicants to have a uh, decent knowledge of either R or Python. R is also used across the NHS and in the civil service. It's an example of open source software. So open source software is kind of, it's, it's free to use typically. Uh, and it's built, maintained, improved, etc., by a global community, uh, which you're part of if you actually use the software. Um, there are a number of different licenses uh, available to license open source software, so you can check to see what license um, you know is associated with a particular open source software package, which will tell you how how you can use it and reuse it. So typically, you can use open source software freely. So that basically means you're not tied to closed or proprietary software like SPSS that needs to be paid for uh, and where you're not even quite sure what's going on under the hood. Over the last decade or so, open source software as a movement has grown absolutely massively. It's supported by many large corporations such as um, you know, uh, Google, Microsoft, Intel, etc. All support Linux, which is a, an operating system that uh, competes uh, with Windows and Mac. So I'm using Linux now actually to uh, on, on the laptop that I'm using to record this uh, and I'm using open source software to actually do the recording as well. Um, open source is widely used across the public and private sectors uh, and really has had a huge impact on computing over the last couple of decades and it's really in the last 10 years or so that you can see um, its sort of take up sort of increased has increased massively. So many governments use open source software. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see that even the UK government provides guidance on uh, building, uh, you know, sort of programs, uh, resources, etc., using open source platforms. The idea is that you're publishing the code that you're writing. Uh, it's a way to improve transparency, flexibility, accountability, uh, and also reproducibility as well. Uh, the Ministry of Justice have got a uh, statement even about uh, you know, their use of open source software and why they make all of the code that they develop open so that others, others can see it. But it's really not just uh, a distinction between open source software and closed software. It's really a question of the right software for the right kind of job. So within the biomedical sciences, uh, broadly defined, you probably don't want to be using closed software such as Excel, SPSS, GraphPad, MATLAB, etc. if what you want to be doing is making sure that your research is open and reproducible. If you want your research to be open, transparent, and reproducible uh, to others, it's better to use open source software such as R, uh, Python, Octave, Julia, etc. And what you really want to be doing is making your entire analysis pipeline reproducible. So all the way from sort of importing your data uh, from whatever you know, uh, source you've used to collect your data, the data wrangling, all the tidying that's going on, building your various graphs, statistical modeling, etc. 
You want all of that to be reproducible, uh, so you can actually run, rerun the entire pipeline at some future point. And this is particularly useful if you suddenly, uh, you think you finished an experiment, you do all your analysis, everything else, uh, and then suddenly realize you need it to actually replace a couple of participants. It's a very laborious process to actually then kind of do the whole data tidying, visualization uh, kind of, you know, steps again, unless you've actually made your entire workflow reproducible and have coded it using something like R, in which case it's simply a matter of clicking run with your new data now included. Uh, so one button press will actually rerun the, the entire uh, analysis pipeline again. But it's also important uh, to use open source software uh, if you want to be using, uh, you know, working collaboratively and if you're wanting to share your research pipeline with colleagues, say, in another lab uh, who are maybe using a different computational infrastructure. Um, it's also good for your future self um, because, you know, just because a particular analysis works on your machine at one point in time, that's no good when it doesn't work on your collaborator's machines or it actually doesn't work on your new machine. But if you code everything using a language like R, you can basically be assured that you can run it again on a different machine, slightly different infrastructure, it'll produce exactly the same sorts of results. So there are many advantages to using open source software generally. Uh, open source allows for uh, your research to be transparent and reproducible so that others can see all the steps involved in your data processing, your data wrangling, etc. And one thing that's particularly useful is it allows others to spot and correct errors that they may pick up in the software that you're using. So there was an interesting case a while back where a script that had been written in Python uh, and was widely used actually had a bug in it. And it was related to how Python works on, uh, on different um, platforms, Windows versus Mac versus uh, um, Linux. Um, widely used as a script that was widely used in chemistry and as soon as somebody picked up on this bug that meant that it wasn't always working the same way across platforms, it was quickly corrected and then everybody could easily redo their analysis. So, so it's all about having that transparency built in uh, and you know if the this particular script hadn't been coded in an open source language such as Python, nobody would have ever spotted the mistake and papers would probably still be coming out now, which had the error in them. So that's all about, you know, you know, using the right software in the right kind of way. Um, what happens when it all goes a bit wrong? So what happens when you use uh, software in a manner that maybe it wasn't uh, originally designed to be used? And I guess one of the, um, some of the sort of most high profile examples are the recent case uh, of you know, issues with Excel, uh, nothing wrong with Excel per se, but you have to be aware of some of the problems that can arise from either using Excel in the wrong way or something that Excel might do to your data that you weren't expecting it to do. So it was, uh, it was discovered a while back that in the field of genetics, one in five genetics papers actually had errors in them because what Microsoft, Microsoft Excel did when you imported uh, data that contained gene names, it actually converted some of those to calendar dates. And you don't have to be an expert in genetics research to realize that this is probably not a good thing. Uh, and solving this problem wasn't completely straightforward. Uh, it turned out that it was actually easier for the scientific community to rename genes than it was for Excel to be updated. Um, so these genes have all been renamed so that Excel now can't helpfully convert them to dates. There's another case, uh, I guess, associated with the um, sort of uh, austerity policies that were introduced after the uh, a sort of global financial crisis, um, where the spreadsheet that was uh, developed to inform governance policies about why austerity was a good thing uh, actually had errors in it. They're only picked up by chance by this graduate student over here who basically showed that a number of cells in the spreadsheet 
hadn't been included in the calculations that the um that the economists had actually developed so you know that's kind of slightly problematic because uh as you i'm sure you're all aware a lot of governments around the world based their austerity policies uh, on this kind of economic modeling a little bit more recently in the context of covid uh, Excel was added again, or I should say people were using Excel in the wrong kind of way. Uh, one of the problems was that a number of COVID cases uh, were missed off. Uh, the um, collection of COVID cases in the UK because Excel effectively ran out of space. They were using an old Excel data format that wasn't able to cope with the amount of data that they were needing to, uh, needing to record. And not surprisingly, uh, all over Twitter, uh, people were pretty shocked. You know, people who do uh, data science, uh, you know, for a living, or you know, are sort of technically literate people, uh, just couldn't believe that the government were, was actually using spreadsheet software like Excel for building uh, what effectively is a large database because it's not designed for something like that. So there are lots of great tweets, kind of capturing uh, people's incredulity. Uh, over over um, the use of Excel, and particularly like this one down here of our uh, good old friend, I guess, Clippy from a number of years ago. Okay, so that's kind of why open source uh, is, is useful, because it's transparent, you can see what's going on, uh, and why you want to make sure that you're using the right software for the right job. And I guess in uh, biomedical research, so, you know, including psychology, lots of uh, life science subjects uh, you know people might have been using a language such as SPSS up to this point this is a nice uh, quote I saw a number of years ago on Stack Overflow uh, comparing R to SPSS SPSS is like a bus it's easy to use for the standard things but very frustrating if you want to do something that is not already pre-programmed R is a four-wheel drive off-roader with a bike in the back, a kayak on top, good walking and running shoes in the passenger seat, mountain climbing and plunking gear in the back. R can take you anywhere you want to go if you take the time to learn how to use the equipment, but that's going to take longer than learning where the bus stops are in SPSS. I think that's a really nice um, sort of contrast of the kind of differences between R and SPSS. Or in mean form, this is a great uh, visualization by uh, Darren Daly, uh, basically comparing um, all the various statistical uh, data science programs languages that people might be using in uh, in academia. Okay. Now, I guess because R is a bit of open source software, it's also part of that broader community that has a philosophy uh, centered around uh, empowering others giving other people globally, regardless of means, uh, giving them the tools to do good work, tools that will be useful to them. And because of that, a lot of the material for R, like textbooks, etc., are also open source as well. So you can buy them if you want on Amazon. I mean, it's always nice to give the, the author some money. But you can also access free online versions of these books because they're published openly. Uh, this is a great book to start with, R for Data Science, uh, by Hadley Wickham and Garrick Rulamund. So Hadley Wickham is a name you're going to see again and again uh, as you use R, if you ever sort of follow Twitter feeds about R. Uh, he's a chief scientist at R Studio. Uh, and I think Garrick Rulamund was actually his PhD student at the time. So you can access the book, you can buy it, or you can click on this link here. Uh, there's a slightly more advanced R book available if you really want to get into R uh, as a programming language rather than a language just for doing data analysis. So Hadley Wickham is regularly described as a man who revolutionised R. So R has been around since the early 90s, but over the last decade or so, it's just you know grown in popularity because of all the packages that have been published by uh, computer scientists, by data scientists uh, that allow... Uh, people uh, who are maybe not computer programmers because you know many people aren't computer programmers but allow people uh, uh, with much more general or domain specific skills to actually get into using the language for the sorts of uh, statistical analysis and visualization that they want to do 
Uh, and Hadley Wickham is the, as I said, chief scientist at our studio. And he's also the lead author on many of the most popular R packages involved in data visualization, uh, data wrangling, data tidying, etc. And they're all packages that are part of what's known as the tidyverse, which is something you're going to hear about and again and again across my across my videos. And there's a good article about Hadley that you can find uh, from that link there on the slide. So R is widely used by a large number of organizations. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few of them here. So you will you will have seen graphics produced uh, by various packages in R. If you've ever watched the news, if you've ever read a newspaper, you're going to have seen R in action, uh, whether you've been maybe aware of it or not. So Nate Silver's 538 website uh, is basically powered by R. Uh, for all this data visualization, data analysis. Uh, the YouGov model that's typically used to forecast election results has got R doing uh, most of the work on predicting election outcomes under the hood. The BBC website and a number of BBC programs um, use data visualization, uh, the data visualization package ggplot2 and R to produce all the kind of infographics and visualizations that you'll see on the BBC News website and also in programs on television. Um, and again, in keeping with the whole open source philosophy, the BBC have actually published their cookbook, which allows uh, anybody to produce BBC, BBC style graphics using um, R, ggplot2 and their cookbook, which actually provides all the code so that you're able to produce um, BBC quality graphics with, you know, not a huge number of lines of our script. So, you know, I think that's really interesting to dig into. And it's, you know, the their cookbook is freely available. It's open uh, for everybody to, to access. Now, much more generally, I think it's, you know, acquiring coding skills where it's R or in Python are just, just a really good bunch of skills to have. If you ever worry about employability, even either for yourself or for your students, it's important to realize that data science as a subject area is a growing employment destination for psychologists and actually other people right across the biomedical sciences. So having that uh, domain specific knowledge associated with the discipline plus computational skills using software such as R or Python is a really invaluable mix of skills uh, to have. And if we're thinking about um, life outside or beyond academia, I saw this great tweet um, a couple of years ago, I think it was now. Uh, if your department teaches quantity of skills in SPSS, SAS or MATLAB, is it really preparing students for quantitative jobs outside of academia? And if you look at this uh, sort of troll of um, data scientist posts, almost 5,000 advertisements, and look at the kind of skills that uh, are mentioned in, the, in those job advertisements, uh, so you get database languages like SQL, but up there, Python and R uh, in the top four skills for people to have, Excel too, not surprisingly, uh, as long as you use Excel in the right kind of way. Um, and way down at the bottom, you've got SPSS, because it's not really used outside of academia. And if we're wanting to give people um, the kinds of skills that they can use outside of academia, we should be teaching them R or Python or both. Um, so the world's changing. Uh, some institutions have really embraced uh, you know, teaching their students uh, open source software such as R and Python, whereas other institutions have kind of been living in a bubble. This is a tweet um, from a few years ago, a uh, attendee from a very prestigious university who went to a brain hack school where they were, you know, basically using various computational tools and bits of software uh, in their research. And the instructors were, you know, saying things like, okay, so you all know about Docker, you all know about Jupyter, GitHub, Binder, Python, you could add R to this. Uh, and while some of the attendees were very familiar with all these different computational tools, uh, this particular person suddenly thought, crikey, uh, it feels like I've spent the last four years of my PhD on Mars. Because the world, you know, 
had changed a few years ago and is continuing to change in terms of the adoption uh, of these sorts of uh, bits of software. Um, and that change is only, is only increasing as far as I can see. And we kind of know in the context of biomedical research, uh, certainly in the, when we think about the replication crisis and the reproducibility crisis, that being able to do research in an open, transparent and reproducible manner uh, is absolutely critical. Now, one thing I should say is that uh, you're not going to be doing any pointing and clicking when it comes to using R. You're going to be doing a bit of coding. And that's okay. Uh, it's a, uh, a journey that uh, will have its ups and downs. Um, it's, it gets you to think about problems in different sorts of ways. Coding requires you to break, take a bigger problem and break it down into discrete chunks that you can then solve almost independently of each other before kind of linking linking them together in some sort of uh, in some sort of pipeline. Um, if you've never done any coding before, don't worry. Um, everything that I teach in the context of R or other courses I teach on Python basically assume no prior experience with coding at all. Um, but it's really good. It's a really good skill to acquire. And you'll be oscillating between these two states. This is, you know, you'll you'll some days you'll feel you're in absolute command and control of everything that you're doing when it comes to coding in R. And other days you're gonna feel a lot like this. And I think this is probably true regardless of how experienced you are uh, in using R or Python or any other bit of software you're, where you're doing coding. Um, you know, these are just two states that you'll be uh, going to, going between uh, sometimes in the matter of, you know, just a few seconds, you'd be flipping between these two states. That's fine.